Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Welcome Trust Human Heredity and Health in Africa Media Briefing Conference Call. My name is Dave and I'll be your coordinator for today's conference. For the duration of the call, you will be on listen only. However, at the end of the call, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If at any time you need assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad and you will be connected to an operator. I'm now handing you over to Dr. Eric Green to begin today's conference. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Eric Green. I'm the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, part of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. As the moderator said, this is being um, videocast, and uh, those of you who are interested in calling in later to ask uh, questions of any of the participants, let me give you that number now. If you want to call and ask questions, you dial 44, then 203 003 2666. That's 44 203. 003-2666. Today, the National Institutes of Health and the Wellcome Trust are announcing a new partnership to fund and conduct population-based studies in Africa. The initiative is called Human Heredity and Health in Africa, or H3 Africa. It has several goals, including using new research tools to help us understand the relationship between genes and the environment and health and disease. The effort also intends to build capacity on the African continent so that African researchers can conduct these types of studies on their own populations. The partnership, as you will hear, also includes the African Society of Human Genetics, which is helping get the effort off the ground. I'm here from the National Human Genome Research Institute because my institute will manage NIH's portion of the partnership. But now to help you understand the NIH's um, involvement in this, I'd like to introduce the director of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins. Francis. Thanks, Eric. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning, and I think this is a very significant announcement uh, of a major project, which in many ways is timed nicely uh, at the 10th anniversary of the announcement of the draft of the human genome sequence in June 2000. Here we are 10 years later now with major advances in technology that have occurred over that timetable with the intention uh, as a joint effort between the National Institutes of Health and the Wellcome Trust and the African Society of Human Genetics uh, to try to put together a really bold program to understand genetic and environmental contributions to common diseases in, in sub-Saharan Africa. The U.S. recognizes uh, that the global uh, is not uh, the opposite of domestic, and domestic is not the opposite of global. Uh, we live in a global world, and if we want to understand the causes of illness, we need to investigate them all over uh, this globe. And Africa is a special place to carry out those kinds of studies because there is more genetic variation in Africa than anywhere else on Earth, and Africa is the cradle of humanity. And things that we learn in Africa will undoubtedly have broad implications for peoples in all other parts of the planet. And so we're delighted to be part of this. The focus is going to be both to try to understand genetic contributions to infectious diseases, but also to non-communicable disorders like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, which represent the most rapidly growing causes of morbidity and mortality in Africa, even though infectious diseases continue to be an enormously high priority. Because these are important goals and the payoff is potentially large, NIH has already invested $750,000 this year just to get this project started. And the project is going to be called H3 Africa for Human Heredity and Health in Africa. Starting in October of this year, the uh, U.S. government will invest $5 million a year uh, over a five-year period for a total of $25 million in this program. Now, we expect that out of this research, uh, there will be broad studies carried out to understand the genetic contributions to both infectious and non-infectious disorders, as well as uh, surveying the in initial ways in which those diseases come about. Uh, we hope that uh, this will also provide an opportunity for African investigators to collaborate with each other. The intention here is to empower scientists in Africa to take the lead on this program. Uh, that means that the resources will be also including efforts to in improve training in, the, in that area. 
And out of this, uh, this will become a community resource project. The idea is that the data that comes forward from this project will be broadly accessible so that all the bright brains uh, on the continent of Africa and elsewhere can work together in trying to discern from this the insights that we hope to obtain about health and disease. So again, I'm delighted to be here on this uh, signal moment of announcing a program that I don't think we could have imagined even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And the time is right now to get this going. And with our partners at the Wellcome Trust, we are delighted to have a chance to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. I'd like to now introduce the director of the Wellcome Trust, Sir Mark Walpart. Dr. Walpart. Eric, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, first thing to say is how delighted I am um, that we're announcing this program today. Um, and of course, we've worked in close partnership with the National Institutes of Health from the beginnings of the Human Genome Project. And so this is a very logical continuation. And the last 10 years have seen the most extraordinary progress. Um, so the technology has now changed. So the first human genome took about 10 years to do and cost roughly a billion dollars. Um, they're now sequencing in the major genome centers more than one human genome every day. Um, and the challenge now is to take that from the laboratory to the clinic. Um, and so this fits very well with um, the work that the Work and Trust has been supporting. And in a similar way to NIH, we've been supporting research in Africa for very many years. Um, and there are different elements of it. Firstly, the study of the diseases themselves, uh, the major killers in Africa, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, uh, childhood infection. Um, but as Francis has said, um, non-communicable disease is rising up the agenda as well. And so diabetes, obesity, um, heart disease, cancer are all becoming major problems as well. Um, so one element is obviously looking at the disease. The other, and this is highly relevant to public health actually, is the study of cohorts of people through time. Um, and it's very important that studies similar to the Framing study, Framingham study in the United States, the Biobank study in the United Kingdom, studies like these happen in Africa as well. Um, and that's highly relevant to the health of the population because information from those studies contributes not only to studies of how the human genome interacts with the environment, variation to, to increase susceptibility to disease, uh, but this tells you about the health of the populations and will direct um, health interventions as well. Um, it's also about people. Um, it's about developing capacity. Um, in order to make the most of human genetics now, one needs people who are skilled in bioinformatics. So it's about training people so that the data analysis can happen in Africa. And it's also about building institutional capacity, the institutional capacity to provide an environment for this sort of research, for first-class health research. Um, and so this is, an, in fact, an extremely important initiative, and it builds on the type of investment that we've made in institutional capacity where we've now funded seven networks of institutions across sub-Saharan Africa involving more than 50 institutions. Um, the Wellcome Trust will be contributing approximately £8 million over the next five years to the, this initiative, and I think probably rather more um, over time. Um, and that will include fellowships, it will include training, it will include capacity development, it will include the phenotyping and the genotyping. Um, and we will be allocating that through a transparent grant funding mechanism. So it couldn't be more timely in the uh, 10th anniversary week of the completion of the draft human genome. And I'm really excited to be making this announcement today. Thank you, Dr. Walpart. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Charles Ratimi, who has been a driving force in creating H3 Africa. Dr. Atimi has an unusual background. He was born in Nigeria, and he earned his professional degrees in the United States, and is now an intramural researcher at the National Human Genome Research Institute, where he directs the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health. Dr. Atimi is also the president of the African Society of Human Genetics. Dr. Atimi? Thank you very much. Again, I'm going to try to contain myself here because of the excitement level. Uh, this is something that uh, we've been talking about, uh, H3 Africa, uh, under the bigger umbrella of what we're thinking in terms of human genome project uh, for, for Africa, uh, what we call African Genome Project at that time. But this discussion really started uh, under the umbrella of the African Society of Human Genetics uh, in 2007 in Cairo, where we felt as uh, uh, geneticists and epidemiologists and clinicians and other types of researchers from Africa that we needed to make sure 
that whatever benefit that we are going to accrue from using genomics to understand health and human history, that that doesn't go past Africa like a lot of other revolutions have done in the past. So we started the discussion without necessarily knowing where the money is going to come from and how we're going to do this, but we wanted to make sure that we at least try to put things in place and hopefully we will get the attention of key funding agencies. And uh, I'm very, very happy to be here today to say we are now launching uh, Human Heredity uh, and Health in Africa, uh, H3 uh, Africa. And uh, this is extremely exciting to me. And uh, we will need to get the attention of the uh, National uh, Institute of Health and also the Wellcome Trust uh, to provide the initial momentum uh, and significant funding uh, for, this, uh, for this effort. So under this umbrella, although we now have expanded this initiative to go beyond just understanding genetics, like uh, Mark and Francis you know, said, we are indeed going to build large cohorts of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, if you heard recently about how genomics is being used, you know it requires a lot of people to be able to understand human genetic variation, how that relates to health. So we are not just going to be looking for genes, we are going to set up clinical cohorts, going to set up clinical centers around Africa to be able to gather this kind of huge number of individuals to do this kind of study. Uh, so this is again extremely exciting. Uh, so we are going to set up uh, resources to enable us to do gene environment interactions. There are unique environmental characteristics of Africa that you, can, you, you have to do it within Africa to be able to understand how these interactions occur. So again, very, very exciting. And lastly, I'd like to talk about the fact that this funding is really going to start to change things in the way we do research in Africa. Traditionally, what occurs is that African scientists participate in the development of uh, scientific projects, and most of the time those resources end up outside of Africa. We are hoping under this umbrella that we are going to do things differently. Whereas those resources are primarily going to remain in Africa, but they will be open to global collaborations. Uh, and, and to create that sense and to foster uh, intra-Africa intra collaborations between scientists. So the issue of building biorepositories, the issue of, of building uh, centers of excellence, uh, you know, the issue of uh, training of young uh, investigators or not so young investigators to be able to do the science in a way that they can truly be first authors of these major type of publications. Uh, right now, if you look at science and nature genetics or nature, uh, most of the research is coming from Africa and are uh, indeed not led by African scientists. And I don't think that's because of lack of uh, intellectual capacity, but it's just, again, not having the necessary uh, uh, infrastructure and resources to be able to do that at this present time. And I, I'm hoping that under this umbrella, we can begin to do things uh, very, very different, uh, differently. Again, to, to end my, my comment, I'd like to really thank the Wellcome Trust and the NIH for stepping up uh, to create this kind of um, big umbrella that we can begin to put things in place uh, to really change the way research is done on the continent. Uh, uh, in, so I'm, I'm extremely excited about this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Atimi. So it's important to recognize that the efforts to date in planning H3 Africa have been sort of a tripartite collaboration between the African Society of Human Genetics, the National Institutes of Health, and the Wellcome Trust. And various of, various of us have been working um, to try to plan so what some of these activities might be. And so far, we have divided the tasks um, in terms of formulating the scientific plan into two working groups. One focused on the genetics of communicable diseases and the other on non-communicable diseases. So I'd now like to turn this over to one of the chairs of one of these working groups to describe what's been done so far. Dr. Bangadi Mayosi is chairman of a working group focused on non-communicable diseases. He is professor of uh, medicine and head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Mayosi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Green, for, for the opportunity to be at, at this meeting. Uh, I also want to share my uh, excitement uh, with this particular initiative from the National Institutes of Health and the Wellcome Trust. And I want to point out uh, as a person working uh, in Africa that it actually indicates a very, very important shift in the way uh, science is done in Africa. Uh, up until now, I think we've been operating almost in a colonial mode of doing science where people from outside Africa have been coming to collect samples and then processing them outside Africa, publishing the papers, and generally promoting the careers and the knowledge of people who are outside Africa. 
What is different about this initiative, as Dr. Rotimi has said, it is that it seeks to do science in Africa uh, by Africans and for Africans. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a key shift. Uh, it's an historic uh, step forward, I think, in the science making uh, of, of the world and, 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 and is, a, is a response to the calls that many of us have been making about what needs to happen to, in fact, change the course and, and the fortunes of Africans. For most people, uh, when they think of health problems in Africa, they think about malaria, uh, AIDS, and uh, tuberculosis. It is true that uh, Africa is still uh, blighted by these uh, formidable communicable diseases. But of late, uh, we have observed a rise in non-communicable diseases. So that uh, whilst we still do battle with communicable diseases, we must now begin to focus our understanding on the role of genes and environment and in the rise of disorders such as uh, heart disease, obesity, uh, diabetes, cancer, as well as uh, mental health. The committee that I chair uh, seeks to identify the diseases which will be most fruitful uh, for, uh, uh, for, for, for work through the H3 Africa projects. These are very difficult questions, uh, and uh, we are still working to identify the sorts of populations and the sorts of uh, diseases that will be amenable to a, a, a genetic approach. The work groups, which are under the auspices of the African Society of Human Genetics, they will also provide a, a network through which individual researchers will learn uh, as well as, 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 as develop. My working group, uh, which is working on uh, non-communicable diseases, has already met several times, and we have identified a range of possible studies that can be tackled, and we are uh, busy formulating the roadmap for, for this project. There is a meeting that is planned in Oxford in early uh, August, where both the people working on non-communicable diseases as well as those working on communicable diseases will meet to share their thoughts on how best to uh, take this opportunity. It is likely that there will be quite a, a lot of overlap between those two groups working on communicable as well as non-communicable diseases. But it is also likely that there will be unique topics that will be uh, uh, become obvious. Uh, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are certain diseases uh, that are unique uh, to the region that still persist, such as rheumatic heart disease, which in fact straddles the infectious and the non-infectious divide. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that condition still exists there, and humanity has got an opportunity to understand its genetic origins, so that as we try to eradicate it, we can learn uh, its uh, unique uh, secrets that it, it, it keeps for biology. So overall, I think this project is not only significant for the people of Africa, for investing in the intellectual capital of Africa, but I think it's also going to be important for biology and for uh, lessons for the global community at large. Uh, thank you. Okay, I would now like to open the floor for questions. Um, uh, please introduce yourself and let us know who your question is directed to. And if you're asking a general question, then I will find someone to answer it for you. So, Great. Thanks. Uh, Mark Henderson from The Times. Um, I've got a, a few questions here, um, probably for different people. First of all, could I ask um, uh, Dr. Atimi and Dr. Maosi, um, perhaps, uh, we've learned an awful lot about the genome in the last 10 years, but the majority of that has been focused on uh, populations of European and, to a lesser extent, Asian origin. Um, do you feel that the gen genomic revolution has, until now, perhaps passed Africa by a little bit, and how do you hope that this project will address that? That's the, the first question. The second question, and I don't know who is best placed to answer this, is what kind of genomic study do you have in mind? Are we talking about GWAS? Are we talking about further uh, resequencing studies? Do we need to do a new version of the Thousand Genomes Project with very large numbers of uh, African <coughs> genomes given the diversity of the African population. And then further for, for Dr. Collins, when I uh, interviewed Hal Varnas last year, he mentioned that uh, he was very keen on the idea of science as diplomacy and uh, as a way of um, promoting um, the US, the UK, etc. abroad. How does this fit into that? So why don't we start with Charles? Okay. <clears throat> I think you can make a very strong case that Indeed, uh, uh, until now, 
uh, that um, at least the way we have applied uh, the genomic uh, uh, science uh, to understand health has for the most part uh, really been, uh, Africa has been left out of that. Um, a good example uh, to look at that is uh, only one genome-wide association study has been published so far that is solely based on African population, and that is the malaria gene uh, publication. Uh, you know, so out of you know, hundreds of genome-wide association that has been done, uh, it's really, one can say it's pretty tragic you know, to, to think that uh, the whole of continent of Africa, only one has been done so far. So to a very large extent, we've not uh, equally applied uh, the tools of genomics uh, in terms of trying to understand health. Uh, there have been you know, various attempts to try to rectify that recently. For example, the Thousand Genome Project has now included quite a, uh, more African populations in that regard. Uh, but again, that science, like uh, you know, my colleagues and you know, everybody on the table has been indicating, most of those are science that are indeed being driven you know, in the West you know, and, in, and in Asia. Uh, so again, this umbrella that we are creating here, uh, we are hoping again to begin to change that dynamics uh, in a way that uh, we can actually apply genomics uh, to diseases that are relevant uh, to African population, important to African populations. And uh, they taking advantage of a unique environment, a cultural environment uh, that exists there to understand gene environment interactions. And perhaps uh, just equally as important, is to study neglected diseases, to use genomics to, uh, to understand genome, uh, neglected diseases. For example, uh, with funding from uh, NIH and Wellcome Trust, we are currently looking at uh, podoconiosis uh, in uh, uh, part of uh, Ethiopia, which is a disease that looks like elephantiasis, but it is not. It's a completely neglected disease. It used to be in Europe, but it's not here anymore. Uh, and uh, we are trying to use the genome-wide association approach to, to try to understand the disease. There's genetic susceptibility, but you get it because you don't wear shoes. Uh, you know, so it's a truly classic gene environment interactions that cannot be studied anywhere else but in that environment. So that's those are kind of uh, um, opportunities that exist uh, uh, in the, on the continent uh, to understand you know, and solve African problems. And in the hope, again, to solve global problems, because uh, Africa is the, is, the true, is the trunk and root of human evolutionary history. So what we get from there is going to be also equally important to different parts of the world. So, so your second question was, what exactly are you going to do? Are, you, are we doing genome-wide association studies? Are we sequencing genomes? Um, I'll yield to anybody who else. I'll take the first pass at it and just point out that um, you know, advances in genomic technologies, and as Dr. Walport mentioned, the plummeting cost, the, plum I mean, the, the fact that this, the cost for genome sequencing are plummeting, are opening up opportunities so that th the answer to your question is we're going to do all those things. Exactly. I mean, that's the bottom line, because we can. And, and um, importantly, though, we're going to build a broader-based approach for collecting individuals, getting good phenotyping done on those individuals, and bringing contemporary genomic technologies to bear on those collections, which is going to provide the opportunities that you heard two of our speakers in particular talk about, projects that, that otherwise have been neglected, but now they're empowered by genomic advances. Anybody I, want to add to this? I agree with that completely. I mean, I think actually the, the, the most difficult bit in many ways is the phenotyping. Mm. So the, 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 the sequencing is changing dramatically, and it's changed dramatically in the last five years. It's likely to change equally dramatically in the next mm. five, I suspect, in terms of uh, cost reduction. So as Eric says, it is all of the above. The phenotyping, the actual really detailed clinical, clinical analysis is very hard. Um, and I think that's going to be the, the, the biggest challenge, actually. Yeah. No, there is a scientific point here that hasn't been made yet, and, and maybe it should be pointed out, that there are unique aspects of the African yeah. population that empower this ability to track down genetic contributions to common diseases. The African population is older uh, than Europe and Asia, which means that the neighborhoods where genetic variants travel together in lockstep are smaller. That turns out to be really useful because if you're seeking a genetic variation that's functionally involved as a risk factor for diabetes or high blood pressure, and you find that in a European or an Asian population, well, you are finding generally uh, dozens of those variants that are all equivalent in terms of their yes. predictive power because they're all in lockstep in this larger neighborhood, and your resolving power is limited by that. 
In Africa, because the population has been around longer, the neighborhoods are smaller, <coughs> there's been more recombination. And therefore, the ability to shine a bright light on what the functional variant is that's actually responsible for that diabetes risk or that high blood pressure risk is substantially better. And that is a resource that will help in tracking down uh, these ancient variations that are probably present across the world, but in Africa will be more easily delimited to a more precise interval. That's going to help us a lot in the current circumstances where we have hundreds of these variants that have been identified in general, but we, for very few of them, actually know which specific letter of the DNA code is responsible for the risk. Africa will help us with that. Now let me answer your question about science as diplomacy because I feel quite strongly about that as a really <coughs> exciting opportunity that we have right now and that was one of the motivations when I decided what the five areas were of greatest uh, opportunity in science right now at NIH. Global health is one of those five. And it's because the science is exciting and because things have come along in the last few years that have made it possible to tackle global health problems, both infectious and non-infectious, in ways that we couldn't have contemplated. But it is also this opportunity uh, to reach out uh, to the rest of the world uh, with what has been called soft power or maybe smart power. Uh, to be able to draw the peoples of the world together in a shared effort to try to understand the causes of illness and the means to prevent and treat disease, surely uh, that emphasizes our shared humanity. Uh, surely that is part of what a society should try to do uh, for other societies. Surely that fits uh, with what the Wellcome Trust has mm -hmm. been doing for decades and what the National Institutes of Health stands for. But we have a special opportunity right now to do that, and I think H3 Africa is a wonderful example of how to take resources and apply them in that way. Other questions from individuals in the room? Yes. Uh, Kate Kennan from Reuters. Um, you mentioned um, that the, you might be setting up uh, similar things to the UK Biobank. Um, do you have any um, details yet on where those kinds of things will be set up? And also, um, you were talking about collaboration within the continent. Um, collaboration is quite limited at the moment, as far as I know, and I think South Africa is actually way ahead of the rest of Africa in terms of research. How are you going to be able to spread that, that network through this? So I might suggest Dr. Rotimi take the first question and Dr. Mayosi will take the second question. Right. Uh, again, the first question was how do we I'm not, I'm not where, sure. the build, where are the bio uh, banks, where, where are the repositories? We, we have set up two working groups uh, that uh, one of the attempts of reference uh, for them is to help us to identify, uh, first of all, to understand what is currently on the continent uh, in terms of infrastructure. And as part of that evaluation process, they are going to make, a rec they are going to make recommendations that will guide us you know, into to say these are areas where something like a bio repository can indeed be facilitated, either because there's something that is already there that can be improved upon, or that the environment lends itself uh, to that kind of support, uh, to support that kind of uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, but it has to be located in such a way that we are creating a sense uh, that all African investigators feel that they can actually send their samples there uh, in a way that they can still maintain ownership, but to be uh, available for large uh, you know, collaborative effort. And I think that would go a long way to foster uh, intra-Africa collaboration uh, between African, uh, African scientists. You, uh, sorry to, yes. you don't worry that that's going to basically focus the new stuff where the old stuff is already, I mean, if you're looking at where the infrastructure is already in place, isn't there then a risk that? You yes, know? there's definitely that risk, uh, but uh, we are sensitive to that, uh, and that is not to just continue to give to those that already have. Mm. Uh, so there are going to be opportunities, it just depends on the activity. Uh, for example, if we are setting up clinical centers, uh, which is going to be critical, like what Mike and others have indicated here, that phenotyping is really going to be the rate limiting step uh, mm -hmm. in all of this. Uh, and um, when, if we set up clinical centers, it will really enable us now to be able to engage more African institutions, more African countries, because we need large numbers. Mm -hmm. So we are going to set up all these centers around. So uh, the molecular labs may not be as widely spread around, 
uh, the bar repository we cannot build multiple you know maybe one or two uh, uh, you know in different diff strategically located mm -hmm. uh, but there are going to be opportunities to engage more institutions uh, more uh, mm -hmm. uh, centers based on different activities and the best one I think in terms of developing this large-scale epidemiological type cohort uh, that really is needed most of the data we get out of Africa today are really you know challenging because we don't have this large cohort that really says how many people really die from certain conditions and why are they dying from those conditions and we have a systematic way to track these things so there's a lot of you know emphasis here in terms of genetics but I do see a very very important aspect of this study that is not necessarily going to be genetic but setting up this large cohort that will enable us to understand cause of mortality morbidity uh, in a very comprehensive manner and that is going to engage multiple centers across the continent uh, I just want to comment because there is actually more infrastructure than you might think. So there are mm -hmm. demographic surveillance sites which are actually spread across Africa, mm -hmm. many of which are looking at quite large populations mm -hmm. of up to half a million people. So actually there is a lot of infrastructure there. And of course you can't build infrastructure out of nowhere. So I mean, you do have to build science on strength. Um, and and I, I, I think that the network of demographic surveillance sites are very important. They collect vital information about health and disease, about causes of mortality in countries where there isn't always vital registration. So they're a pretty good place for many phenotyping studies to be done, actually. Yeah, the point's very well taken. And I think H3 Africa has the opportunity uh, to build upon a number of other programs uh, where African scientists and, and clinicians are being encouraged uh, to participate in research mm -hmm. in, in new ways. The Wellcome Trust uh, has their network uh, mm -hmm. already of such centers of excellence. We have just started in the U.S. something called the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, mm -hmm. which is partly sponsored through PEPFAR and partly through the NIH, which is aiming to try to build capacity in terms of research capabilities and training. Uh, there is a effort through the G8 meeting going on in Canada uh, this week to focus on the needs for more research and other efforts in sub-Saharan Africa. The Global Health Initiative, President Obama's effort, uh, is now also potentially going to include some research activities and again focused in sub-Saharan Africa. So it is sort of a moment where a lot of things are coming together and I think H3 Africa can serve as a really helpful mm. umbrella uh, to bring uh, many of these ideas uh, in a coordinated way instead of having them all be disconnected. So the second question related to how we're going to sort of change the collaborative uh, style of African yeah. scientists, Dr. Mayos. Yes. Yes, I, I just want to pick on the, the issue of uh, the strength of genetic science in, in, in Africa uh, and, point that, and point out that although there appears to be areas of activity such as South Africa, uh, when you look at South Africa's contribution, although it accounts for 30% of all the publications on genetics from Africa, but actually uh, the South Africans uh, over at least the past uh, 30 years have only been producing an average of 100 papers on genetics a year, mm -hmm. that for about 50 million people is, is, is in fact not a lot. So that the existing genetic capacity, even in those areas that are considered to be strong, is actually relatively uh, uh, in, in the early stages of development and in need of, of, of strengthening. Uh, when it comes to the networks, I think, uh, as has been pointed out uh, by Sir Mark, uh, the demographic surveillance systems are there. Uh, uh, they, they, there's also been quite a lot of uh, good work done by the African Society of Human Genetics mm -hmm. in terms of improving intra-African collaboration. And they have also been more progressive funding, uh, 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 f funding initiatives that have led to institutions within Africa working together, universities, mm -hmm. such as uh, you know, the initiatives from the Wellcome Trust to build research capacity, uh, the initiative from the uh, from PEPFA and the NIH mm -hmm. to try to uh, encourage and build capacity within medical schools. Mm -hmm. So more recently, there's actually been quite a lot of uh, intra-African crosstalk, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is to be encouraged. The universities are organized, the academies are becoming more organized as a voice, so that this particular in initiative will uh, find an environment that is in fact ready uh, to, uh, to, 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 to move forward. Other questions from the floor? If not, um, are there any questions uh, from any phone callers? 
Uh, no, no, we don't have anyone online just at the moment. No. Yeah, sure. Um, is there, will there be any uh, pathogen sequencing as part of this? I, I, would, I would imagine uh, definitely that there will be, again, um, this, if you're dealing with uh, the infectious disease, genetics of infectious diseases, I think you have to look at both the host and the pathogen. Um, I would definitely imagine that would be part of this effort, mm -hmm. yes. And maybe even the vectors. Exactly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Sorry, can I, I'm not sure Please. Yes, <laughs> 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 um, the, uh, I wanted to ask about the chronic disease element of this. Um, and I mean, you said quite clearly that one of the things that you think you're going to get out of this is the more original causes of some of these chronic diseases. Do you think you're going to find um, you know, key differences in the way that these diseases develop in, in different populations as well. Is that what you're, I mean, I know you don't know the answer yet, but, <laughs> but you've kind of got to suspect what the answer is. Is that the sort of thing that you're going to be um, investigating as well as, I mean, you know, again, are, are we looking for things that will help the rest of the world or are we looking for only things that will help African populations in dealing with what is a very... <coughs> fast-growing problem in that. So, so the answer is going to be both, but somebody could add more text to that? Who's I, I, I can try to add some uh, more to that. I, I think, uh, again, it, it would depend on the disease that you're looking at. Um, there are certain diseases that will have unique environmental factors uh, that you can't do it any, you know, in another place. You have to be in that local environment uh, to take advantage of what is it. You know, if, for example, if it is uh, diet, that has the implication for what you're studying, uh, then you need to uh, collect dietary information within that environment uh, you know, to understand. If you wanted to, for example, see the impact of salt on, uh, on hypertension, then you need to see what, how people are cooking their food. Uh, and one of the things that is really interesting in the context of uh, doing this kind of work in Africa, we did a trial, you know, sodium trial, you know, in, um, in, in uh, rural, um, uh, West, you know, rural Nigeria, to try to see how uh, reducing salt can lower blood pressure. Um, and it, would, it turned out that it was actually a much easier study to do in rural Africa than in, in the urban Chicago or, or London uh, because the source of salt in diet is limited. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the salts come as a result of adding bouillon cube uh, you know, to, to your soup. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, teaching women how to reduce that or eliminate it significantly drop blood pressure uh, by four, four millimeters of mercury. That is a unique environment which we can do that kind of so. Mm -hmm. and, and also, the fact that, uh, like what Francis and others have indicated, is that at the genetic level, you do, you do have this opportunity to find map, to use the African you know, um, um, uh, small haplotype structure to find map and to better localize uh, signals that may otherwise uh, be not so clear in European or Asian populations. Uh, so the answer is that we are going to do things that would directly benefit African population, but because we all share common history as humans, that information, I think, for the most part, will directly be relevant to other human populations. Other questions? Uh, we have no questions coming from the phone lines at the moment. Uh, any, have we not mentioned anything that anybody on the panel wanted to make sure we, we, we said or we got across all the points? If not, I thank all of you for participating. Uh, we look forward to talking with you more about this as the program progresses. Um, and um, thanks again.